nobody told me anything. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special CNBC debate at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Let me introduce you to our panel. We have Jiang Jiangqing from ICBC Bank, um, Joseph Jimenez from Novartis, Christophe de Margeret from Total, uh, uh, Judith Rodin joins us from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Chris. Uh, Chris Gopala Krishnan, who comes to us, of course, from Infosys, and Marissa Meyer from Yahoo. Welcome, all of you, to our conversation. So when we all came to Davos this year, I think we thought 2014 would be a year of growth. 2014 would be a year of stability. There was a great deal of cautious optimism about what we might expect to unfold over the next 12 months. Here we have the opportunity to hear from our panelists how they think 2014 is going to play out for them in their own particular sphere of influence. And also maybe we can get a chance to reflect on some of the larger global trends that we see unfolding and which have been talked about here at this World Economic Forum this week. So I wanted to start really with a question about sources of volatility or disruption in your own professional fields this year. Marissa Meyer, if I could start with you on that. Well, I, I do share the optimism that I think has really pervaded the meeting overall. And I think that when you look at disruptions, disruptions really are around change. And in the field of technology, change is always about innovation. And when you look at where we are in the world today, there's almost 2 billion mobile devices. There'll be an additional 2 billion in the next three years. There are literally uh, predictions that there will be trillions of sensors in the world. The Internet of Things is upon us. Everyone having mobile devices is upon us. And we really are living in a hyper-connected reality, which will allow us to create greater efficiencies, better connections between people in ways that we've never done before. And I think that that will be incredibly disruptive, but I also think it can be incredibly positive. Uh, let's move along. Um, Chris? So I'm also very optimistic about 2014 and beyond. Uh, having said that, you know, um, this year we were able to debate on certain issues which need to be resolved sooner than later. For example, the issue of um, unemployment and future of work, uh, the issue of sustainability, climate change. You know, I think we need to uh, address those issues. Technology is going to create significant opportunities. Technology is, going to, technology is going to continue to improve productivity in the future. Uh, the way we live, the way we work will continuously change over the next 20 years, 20, 30 years. But how we as humans adapt to that and change, I think that is going to be very, very important. In terms of disruptions, you know, we are in a very delicate situation. Even small uh, perturbations can create issues. So, for example, in the last two, three days, we saw the issue of the Argentinian currency and the impact it had on the, uh, some of the currencies of the emerging markets. And, and that's the connected world in which we are living. And, and that's a delicate balance. I don't know how we are going to bring stability to the entire system. There were discussions about it, but I think that's also a very important point. Chris. Chris, you've laid out a whole series of challenges and risks for us there. Can I just get you to focus on one specific thing that will be a, a challenge or a disruptor for Infosys this year? So for us, uh, clearly the, trans the, the transition to the cloud and the impact it will have on the outsourcing industry will have um, significant impact on how the industry um, transitions over the next few years. Okay, Judith. Uh, I'm optimistic for business and feel there are challenges for government. The business optimism, now that the macroeconomics look better, the balance sheets are repaired, stock prices are up. The focus on the microeconomics I find very encouraging. So the discussions about unemployment generally, youth unemployment particularly, the discussions about how to grow more inclusive economies, all of those being led by business leaders, I think it, very, very encouraging indeed. I see fragility in governments, that governments are, the social unrest is right below the surface and in the, on the surface for many places. And so how these two sectors interact and sort of 
can enable one another to either succeed or mitigate some of those challenges, I think is the issue for 2014. Christoph. Well, um, I found the um, energy business sector relatively optimistic, the way I am, by the way, but with uh, one, one still strong concern, which is we all now agree, and I don't think you would find any more CEO or companies not being totally certain that we are responsible of what's happening on the climate change, and we cannot be a part of the debate, but at the same time, we understand that we cannot do only what we call bottom-up, but we need also top to bottom, which means regulations. But the problem is, when are the, those regulations going to come, and for how long? And the big problem for any investor, not only in the energy sector, is stability, using your words. And, and we need stability to invest. We need stability to invest for cleaner energy. But I mean, if we are not told how we're going to be treated, and especially if we are treated as enemies, then I don't think it will be something which can work for the long term. So interesting, but, but you feel that's a very real risk again in 2014, that regulation comes that makes your business either less profitable or more difficult. Well, I mean, it's, it's nothing to do with less profitable, even if we don't like when it's less profitable. I don't think anybody likes. But I mean, it's much more, can you invest without knowing what will be the regulation? What will be the tax framework? We need one. And at least then you can decide you invest or you don't invest. But so, I mean, here today, if we don't know, we cannot. And, and 2014 is an important year because it's just before 2015. <laughs> and, to, and 2015, there is this famous COP21, which is to take place in Paris, and we know that a lot of countries are willing for this date to prepare, and that's good news, a big event. It means that those regulations will be prepared in 2014. So it's in 2014 we have to sit and discuss. So you public, public policy makers out there in the audience, um, regulatory certainty is the key as far as uh, Christoph is concerned. Um, Joseph. For healthcare, the disruptor in 2014 is clearly going to be technology. Healthcare is undergoing uh, an explosion of data with deep sequencing of the human genome and the bioinformatics capability that is being built in a number of, <coughs> of, of companies around the world. I think healthcare is going to be able to make advances in medicine that we have not seen in the last 10 years. So the, this data is enabling us to understand molecular pathways in ways that we have never done and draw linkages between diseases that I think are going to lead to breakthroughs over the next 10 years. Can I move it along to uh, Mr. Jiang Ching, uh, or, or uh, Jiang Jiang Ching, and ask you to put your headsets on uh, because he will speak in Mandarin. So can I address that question to you, sir? What do you see as a source of volatility or disruption in your business? 我贊成盛盛樂觀的這種說法。這個2014年對我們這個行業的影響,我覺得有三個方面。大家對這個經濟的復甦的這個狀況看法是有差異的。要進行資本的一個壓力的測定
。那么第三个方面，我觉得还是有技术技术的变化。现在金融业也来自互联网行业的很大的挑战，互联网金融的发展，大数据的这些运用，当然对我们这个行业不仅是挑战，也还有是机遇。Thank you very much. Um, what I want to do now then is move along and focus on some global flashpoints that I think could be issues for business and society in 2014. And I'd like to start with the US debt ceiling, if I might. Renegotiation is imminent. And I'd like to ask the, the US citizens on our panel here whether we're going to see a more bipartisan <coughs> approach to the debt ceiling negotiations. And are we optimistic that maybe this time round we get a resolution that is longer term rather than a kicking of the can down the road? Um, Who'd like to start us off? One of your colleagues said on Squawk Box the other day that he should just leave that in the teleprompter for every two months because the United States will continue to kick it down the road. And I fear that that's correct. I don't see a true bipartisan resolution. I think that there will be less acrimony in this one, I think people frightened themselves the last time around in uh, how difficult it was to come back from the brink. But I don't expect the kind of locking of arms and real solution-driven collaboration um, that we might hope for from our government leaders. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I do. what I see is a government that's as partisan as it's ever been in my lifetime. And so I think that they are able to strike and forge short-term compromises, but it's hard to see a long-term a long-term resolution. Are the consequences of that that we have um, another year of uh, President Obama's second term where there is a limit on the leadership that he is able to bring because of this ongoing by, uh, d dispute over settling the fiscal? Problem well, we've America. talked about certainty, whether it's regulatory uncertainty or budget uncertainty. I think uncertainty is bad for business. It's also bad for the citizens. Uh, I think none of us really wants a government that appears and is portrayed by the media as not functioning effectively. Uh, but uncertainty is really quite damaging, and I fear that we are confronting that in all of our spheres. I think that's exactly the point that the the uncertainty that it creates, it creates an overhang in terms of the business community wanting to lean forward in terms of making investments. So I think over the last few days, we've seen a real shift in the discussion here at the forum from five years of discussing financial crisis now to the, the, um, the conversation shifted towards economic growth and slow economic growth. And I think one of the, the reasons why we're seeing the slowness is, is the uncertainty and that's what, what people want. If we had the certainty, I think you'd see more and more companies around the world leaning forward in terms of investment. Christoph. Well, <clears throat> I've been, I'm amazed because I mean, I'm not American, but I mean, I am in the world, so it's not an American problem. Uh, it's a problem in the financial community. I, I don't know why it has been so much emotional. I mean, I understand in the United States as being citizens, you know, different parties, political aspects. But otherwise, I mean, can you imagine the US going bankrupt? Can you? I cannot. Just simply impossible. Otherwise, I mean, if we could have thought that might happen, we would have stopped investing because all the world would have been collapsing. So, I mean, I have been very calm, and the company too. We didn't sell dollars, we didn't buy dollars. We have been just handling our life as usual because I couldn't believe it will happen. So maybe I am crazy, but maybe I think that the market has been using it and then playing and then making moves. I mean, it's a little of speculation. And I hope that this time the leaders in the States won't help that to happen because they know that they cannot not sign or find an agreement that at least my view. So I hope that this time, yeah. even if it cannot be done, I would prefer that they solve the issue. But in any case, we know that they will yeah. do in the least. So in the case, they will say, OK, we'll find a solution next time. Yeah. But we have a provisory agreement. So, we, so we've gone from cautious optimism about the economy to cautious pessimism about the US government being able to resolve its fiscal problem. Let's move on. 
here at the forum, we had uh, Mr. Rouhani come and talk to us about the direction he'd like to take the Iranian economy. Um, his comments weren't welcomed by everybody. Clearly, Mr. Netanyahu disagreed with some of the positions that were taken. But I will ask you this question, Christoph. Iran does seem to be making some efforts to re-engage with the global community. Total had significant um, operations in Iran previously. Once the, or assuming that the sanctions come off, would you be prepared the next day to go in and reinvest in Iran? Well, I don't know why I knew that will happen. I mean, no question. Uh, I tried to preempt in answering to the debt the US debt, but no, seriously, um, <clears throat> Iran is, uh, is part of the oil and gas world. I mean, there are plenty of oil, plenty of gas. Uh, we don't even talk about uh, non-conventional, because, I mean, we are not at that you know, level of discussions. But uh, what was interesting, and then you can believe or not that it will have an impact, why should they open the debate on new contracts in Iran for the oil industry, oil and gas industry, if they don't think they might find an agreement at the political level, which means nuclear. Because if they don't, the embargo will remain, and we just cannot negotiate and, by definition, sign any contract. So for us, it's very simple. Either the embargo is lifted, which means there is an agreement at the political level, or <coughs> No question. So now, will we be then ready to go and sign immediately? Well, it always takes time. We don't even know today what are the new terms. I mean, President Rani told us during a meeting, he came to present his vision of the future, and he told us the contract will be more attractive than the one you had before. I can tell you that's good news. I, I, but I believe you've described those deals as sexy deals, uh, those contracts as sexy word, contracts. But, uh, yes, I mean, they were not terribly sexy before. Uh, this time, we are told that they will be better. We will see. But, I mean, they have effectively, like for any country, it's nothing to do with Iran. I mean, you have to attract investors. And for the time being, we don't know what the term will be. But uh, we are willing, if the terms are acceptable if the embargo is lifted. Yes, by definition, Iran is a country in which Total has been working for years. And I would say all oil and gas companies, including American companies, have been working in Iran. By the way, much more than Total. Mm. And they made much more money than Total in Iran. So, so, so let me just run this al along the panel just to see if anybody else wants to pick it up. Because um, in our interview, with Benjamin Netanyahu, he described Mr. Rouhani as a man that he could not do business with and the West should not do business with him either. <coughs> Are we rushing a little too optimistically towards some quick resolution of the um, disagreements that we have with Iran because we want to see movement here and perhaps disregarding the fact that there is still no commitment to remove the nuclear threat and Iran actually has given very little so far. Who fancies that one? Um, I, I, I'm not a political leader, but I will say that I believe that there's public statements and private diplomacy. And I think the kind of private diplomacy that appears to be going on right now is behind closed doors. We really don't know yet what agreements there will be. And I think political leaders thrive on their public rhetoric. They're playing to the hometown crowds. Uh, and I am eager to see what the outcomes and willing to believe that there could be outcomes in really deliberative private diplomacy. But it may not work. But I don't take the public rhetoric as being the definitive statements of what's really going on behind closed doors. 
Okay, let's move on. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover here very quickly. Um, I want to talk about um, the other uh, big speech that really got a lot of international attention, and that was Prime Minister Abe, who came and told us about breaking through this deflation ceiling and bringing more women into the workforce. All very admirable goals and ambitions that were stated by him. But there was a fly in the ointment, and I think it was his reference to the 1914 situation and how that may describe the current situation between the People's Republic of China and Japan. And I'd like to ask our Chinese representative from ICBC whether we need to be nervous that through full year 2014 it stops being a talking war and becomes something more serious. So the I've read uh, press coverage of that speech. Uh, those of us who know that part of history, we can see that uh, in the 10 years leading up to 1914, Japan launched a war on the sea. We called it Jiawu Sea War. China suffered heavy losses. Thereafter, Japan began its uh, large-scale invasion of China. After the First World War, uh, that was when Germany was losing and Japan took more territory from China. During a hundred years, uh, it was an invader. It wasn't a victim of invasions. Uh, if you know the history, then uh, you be aware of that. Uh, we now have heard his speech, and uh, we can see what he's doing. And you look back on that part of the history when Japan was the Nazi equivalent in Asia. Well, in the Second World War, that was what Japan was, the Nazi in Asia. China is a peace-loving country. We have never invaded anybody in our history. We've never bullied anybody. Your question was whether there would be a real armed conflict. I think it depends on Japan entirely. Can I ask then, is there any room for words of compromise that might actually ratchet down the uh, current heating up that's going on between various <laughs> diplomatic representatives around the world from your two countries. What will it require for both sides to actually adopt a more conciliatory tone? I'm a banker. You've asked me more than a couple of political questions. I'm not an expert on the topic. Uh, but I think as a Chinese, uh, I do have a view. I think actions were taken by Japan first. Many of the bad things were done by Japan. Um, then can we talk about it? For example, during the Second World War, tens of millions of Chinese died in the Second World War. They were killed by the Japanese invaders. After the Second World War, the tablets symbolizing their souls were put into the shrines. Uh, that hurts the feelings of the Chinese people. So if you look at it, on the one hand, this is what you're doing. On the other, you say, we are willing to talk. Why don't you talk to us? I think the key is Japan. In Chinese, we have a saying, to untie the bell, it requires the person who initially tied it. Thank you. Um, Chris, if I can bring this conversation to you. One are um, you concerned um, about the potential impact of that on India? And two, this is an election year for India where it does appear there may be a change of government. I just wonder in what you do, whether you see significant risks from either of those things for you. Um, so, you know, from a business perspective, 
stability, uh, a Japan that is growing, is very, very uh, important for not just India, but the rest of the world also. Um, the, the growth rate coming back into Japan, you know, economic growth coming back into Japan, I think has had positive impact. And I think we need to sustain that. And, and that's, what how, that's how I would look at this. And, and I think every government would want stability. Every government would want to uh, make sure that um, um, you know, we are able to sustain this going forward. Regarding uh, the elections in India, uh, till the elections are over, there will be uncertainty. Um, Indian elections are always chaotic. Um, you know, it's uh, 1.2 billion people participating in the democratic process, and typically a high percentage of people vote. 60, 65 percent of the people participate in the election process. Very high. Um, it's not very clear uh, what will be the result because six months back we wouldn't have said that a new party, which was just formed, would actually uh, form a government in New Delhi, the capital. So there are uncertainties. And, and I believe that whatever happens, there will be stability beyond the election. Because if I look back at the last three governments at the center, all of them completed their terms, five-year terms. So there will be stability. And that will be good for India and good for the rest of the world, because India will start growing beyond 5% after the elections. Thank you very much indeed. There's just one final risk that I'd like the panel to consider, and I'll take uh, anybody who wants to talk about it. Um, Europe has started to show some signs of growth. Um, it's patchy, but there are things happening. Um, but there are obviously th other things taking place behind the scenes. The ECB is going to be conducting uh, stress tests and will then take up regulation of the banking sector, and we know that credit extension is contracting in the Eurozone at the moment. D does anybody on our panel fear that Europe slips back into recession this year, and that becomes a negative headline for 2014? I think part of it depends on uh, what happens in the rest of the world economy. I think you could see that if there is a slowdown in China, then I think there could be a, a, a slowdown in Europe in terms of whether, if you're projecting 1% growth, Europe could, could flatten. I think what's key in Europe for, for my industry, the healthcare industry, is to ensure that there is a strong reward for innovation. So as, as budgets, government budgets around Europe become tighter for health care, we know that as you're innovating and you are investing in high-risk activity, which is discovering and developing new and innovative therapies, there needs to be a reward for that innovation. So the question is whether that innovation reward will still be there and then making Europe a, a good place for investment for the health care industry, which can then help drive some additional growth in Europe. Christoph, am I correct in understanding that you said Europe should be reclassified as an emerging economy? That, that doesn't suggest a tone of optimism. <clears throat> Must be a problem of translation between French and English. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's true that uh, I, I, I consider that the moment where I said this, that but not sufficient debate about Europe. And uh, I think Europe is part of the world. Uh, it's still the biggest economy uh, as a whole. But uh, is it a whole? That's the problem. But uh, we are, it's as important for Europe to recover that it is, in my opinion, for others to have Europe recovering. And uh, saying this, it's true that I would say exactly what uh, you've said is innovation is what we have to reinvent. And by definition, innovation is invention. And if we continue in our old model, which is to try to compete with emerging countries, which are not emerging anymore, like China and India, we will not win. And we can use words like, they are not respecting the rules, blah, blah, blah. Mm. No, they will be cheaper and as good. So the only chance we have is through innovation to find new products, new services, which will be done 
at all levels yeah. by the European industry. I and, think those and, and are, are longer can... term things. I think one degree of uncertainty that's reduced is that we're no longer talking this year about whether the euro will survive. Mm. And I think that that's critical because, again, as we peel away these layers of uncertainty about how Europe really recovers and what systems it uses, the banks are challenged as they start to need to implement Basel III recommendations, and we are going to see a different kind of regulatory framework that will be tighter and tighter. Mm. But I think the, the uncertainty about the euro is a real positive. See, reinvention, I think, is a theme for everybody, every government, every country, and as individuals also, because the world is changing, and the world will continue to change quite rapidly. This will have impact on how we work. It will have impact on social structures, uh, organizations which are hierarchical are becoming much flatter. Or, you know, the world is becoming more networked. So all of this will require reinvention of many things. We have to reinvent education. Okay. So there are many things we need to I'm reinvent. I'm just going to move on to technology in a second, but I do have one, one more question for you, Christoph. and um, I don't want to go back to perhaps ancient history, but um, is, is it the case that France actually is the problem in the Eurozone right now? Well, I mean, all, all, all countries is uh, first its own problem and the problem for others, and that's not philosophy. Um, you know, you can criticize your neighbor, say, okay, I mean, no name, but I mean one who is very strong in renewables and also using coal or lignite. Okay, that's not the way we will get out of it. The way is just to see what we have to share in common and not to fight against each other. So today, France has problems, but maybe we are also seeing signs of recovery. So instead of looking at, okay, who's next? No, I will not say this. I said Europe as a whole is strong or can be strong. And it's not only the problem of Euro. Because Euro, we can debate, but I think it's largely behind us. Euro, not growth. The real problem is growth. And growth today is not enough to cover the problem of unemployment. Unemployment is a major risk for Europe. And that means for all of us. It's also linked with poverty, with exclusion. So we really need to find solution. And the way is definitely, again, innovation. And innovation is doable because we can, we have the talent, we have the skills, we have the labor, but we need to find new, I would say, I said it, products. If we compete on solar cells, yeah. if the they are not of a higher quality, we will not be able to sell anything. So, so let's move on, um, because I do want to talk. One of the other big themes that's come out for me this year has really been the potential for a technology backlash. Um, and it seems to me that in a number of areas, health, security, whether that's government spying or security of personal data, and in the question of unemployment, technology figures somehow, and it's not always represented as the good guy in the room. So Judith, I just wanted to start with you and pick up on that employment issue because it seems to me a lot of people say technology improves productivity but leads to unemployment. Um, I, I think back a hundred years ago when people were wringing their hands around the Industrial Revolution as an employment killer um, because it was the technological innovation. So I think we're at a turning point. We are seeing some jobs going away because of technology. But I'm optimistic that we really, at this inflection point, will see new kinds of jobs we never thought about, online work creating different kinds of employment and different ways that people are employed. But you are right, the unemployment situation, and particularly the youth unemployment situation, which is a quarter of the world's population, needs to get solved. And I am hoping that technology can really be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And I would just jump in there. We had a really interesting session where we talked about the types of disruptions that would come. And there's a notion that, yes, technology is going to disrupt, but disruption usually results in productivity gains and in the creation of wealth. So the real challenge is can we take that, those productivity efficiencies and that wealth and fuel it into investments towards communication systems so we can, for example, in this space of, of global disasters or natural disasters, communicate to people? Can we fuel it into education to help educate people so we can solve the unemployment problem? Can we fuel it towards inclusion? Because if we can, we can create a flywheel 
right? Because communication, inclusion, uh, communication are all things that are caused by connectivity and to get good systems for those three things, you need connectivity. So if you start and say, the connectivity is going to cause productivity and efficiency gains, the productivity and efficiency gains are going to get invested in education, communication, inclusion, you're gonna get end up being even more connected and hopefully get this nice virtuous cycle. Obviously, the converse could also be true if we don't fuel towards the right type of investment. I think it's incumbent on leadership across all segments to really work to make sure that the productivity gains we see, that the wealth creation we see from that connectivity gets used to solve some of these global problems. So I want to add to this, actually. If you want to take advantage of technology, build this virtuous cycle, you also need to think uh, new models. New models for organizations, new models for how we are going to leverage this. So for example, a company like Apple has 80,000 employees, has millions of people developing apps. They just created the platform and people develop applications. So the impact of Apple is huge because of this. And, and there, this is not direct employment, indirect employment, they are not employees, so we have to think about it. And just as in the Industrial Revolution, we came out with new models for organizational structure, hierarchy, leadership, et cetera, for the knowledge era, we need to think about what are the structures that are relevant. Entrepreneurship, I believe, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship are going to be very, very high in terms of the skill sets that are required and, and then the new models that are needed for business and organizations. Um, absolutely agree, but my dilemma, and I'll bring this to you, Joseph, because this is part of the same story in a way, inequality was a number one risk highlighted here and it was referenced in terms of wealth, growing rich and the poor getting poorer. But I think it's also inequality in many other areas, inequality of the benefits of technology being shared equally, inequality of healthcare outcomes, because technology that allows you to have glass lenses that tell you whether you're diabetic or not will be limited to a very small, wealthy group of elites. One suspects very early on, it'll be many years before it works its way down the food chain. So do we need to be concerned that this year there will be growing unrest about the inequality of outcomes? You know, if you, if you've, there was a lot of discussion over the last few days about health as a driver of economic growth, and it was the linkage between healthy populations and economic growth. If you think about emerging markets, um, there are 100 million people a year in emerging markets that are pushed into poverty because they have to pay out of pocket for, for, um, for medicine or for therapy. That means that they're not in the middle class driving economic growth. So a lot of the discussion focused on how we as a multi-sector approach can, can address inequality in healthcare, in particularly in the emerging markets, in a way that will help build the middle class and drive economic growth. So I don't think it's as much about technology as it is about, at least for health care, building healthy populations. In terms of technology and how that impacts health care, health care, building sustainable health systems around the world is critical because we've seen the increase in cost and it's not going to get better because with the aging population there will be increases in demand for healthcare around the world. So to Marissa's point about a virtuous circle of investment, uh, one of the big uh, issues with healthcare today is hospitalization costs. Well, there are many people who go to the hospital who don't need to go to the hospital, and technology is now, through wearable devices, allowing us to remotely monitor patients. They can stay at home, and those that need to come to the hospital can come to the hospital, but this could be a way of really reducing total health care costs around the world, which then can be reinvested for growth in other areas of the economy. Briefly, Chris. Briefly. So I'm going to disagree with you because it's whether the glass is half full or half empty. If you look at the number of people who have joined the middle class in India, in the last 20 years, more than 250 million people have joined middle class and have access to better health, have access to better education. So, you know, yes, there is still a large population which are not touched, but we also need to look at the, the improvements that have happened in the last few years. Um, Marissa, I want to come to you on the question of um, security, security of data and, and governments and regimes that might use 
the internet and other forms of technology to suppress dissent. And we saw plenty of that happening in 2013, and I still think it's happening in some parts of the world at the moment. Um, how do we resolve this problem that we have, where we want to use the technology for good, but accessing it reveals a lot about us that we might not want revealed? The Germans are now talking about putting servers only in Germany for German data traffic. That, to me, seems to go against everything that we've benefited from as we've opened up the internet to the world. I do think there's a real threat, um, and a lot of people are referring to it quite poetically as a threat that the cloud might get pinned to the ground. Right? And we've worked so hard to achieve a world where we have the efficiencies of scale that come from being able to have your information in the cloud and being able to access it from anywhere. Uh, and it's really important that we think through carefully all the ramifications of, for example, fragmenting the cloud or making the cloud something that's owned by particular countries as opposed to own, where, the, where the users themselves own the data. I, pers I personally, um, at Yahoo, we believe that our users own their data. Uh, and the right way to, to handle that data is to provide transparency, choice, and control. Have the users understand what data is there, how it's being used, both by Yahoo and by the government, which is one of the reasons why we called for more transparency, but also giving users choice. They can make a trade-off in terms of, do they want to have their information used this way? If they don't, they can opt out of the service. They can change the configurations in the service so it doesn't necessarily retain that information about them. And just giving them a large element of control in terms of where that information is directed and how it's used. Can we persuade technology companies to, instead of giving us lengthy terms and conditions that nobody actually reads, because they just want access to the product, so they tick the box anyway, just to have a very simple one or two word question that says, do you want us to store your data or not? And then we can tick the box. Because you get the sense that people pay lip service to the idea of data security, and then they load up loads of sneaky ways of actually making sure they get as much information on you as possible? Well, I think the answer is yes. We, uh, terms and conditions need to be simplified so they can be better understood. I think it's, they can get too simplified, at which point in time they actually become obscuring again. Right, where if you just say, okay, well, here's the data we're collecting, and you don't necessarily say how it's being used and let people make trade-offs, it doesn't have the nuance. When you look at real-world systems, um, like, for example, social security numbers or government IDs, uh, other places in the world. It's funny, when you look back at their genesis, there was a huge amount of fear around them. Would they be used to identify you? Would they be used, how would they actually be used? And the truth is, in many of these cases, the ability to vote, the ability to participate in society, right? The ability to, to you know, actually stand up and be counted, uh, and all the things that come with that actually outweigh some of the privacy you give up um, by having a, a government ID. And so I think that when you look, and that's, those are systems that are generally 80 to 100 years old. These, these online systems are much newer, but if you look at the same piece, I think that we're at the beginning of a very long evolution in terms of how information is used and the benefits that people get from it. And so I do think it's important for each person to be aware of what information is there, what the trade-off is, what they gain from it, mm. um, and because and there, there are a lot of things to be gained, and whether or not that trade-off is worth it for them. But that will be an individual choice, and it should be an individual choice in terms of how the information about you is used and the information that belongs to you is used. So I agree, um, you know, in the concept that the data belongs to the individual. I think that's a very, very important point. Just like, you know, we look at physical wealth attached to a person or an organization, entity, we need to look at that data belonging to that entity. Having said that, you know, let's say in Davos, an individual has some challenges, you know, has his privacy broken. Who do they go? The local police or the court or something like that. They need the capability to help that individual. Now that is where you will have to balance between the, the, the capability that exists in the state to help the citizens of the state versus the benefits the, citizen, the technology will provide. So this is something which we have to discuss and debate. Maybe there are some international agreements that are required or we need to figure out whether copies of data not the we still get the benefits of the cloud, but copy of data that belongs to the citizens of that country is also available within the country for national security reasons, for criminal investigations, things like that. 
I'm wondering how the technology companies think about Jared Lanier's controversial new book in which he proposes that if the person really owns their data, they ought to be able to sell their data to the company and actually monetize it. Uh, I, think, I think that's actually a really interesting concept because if you have, and there is real value in that data, if you have that value, you should be able to monetize it. Another interesting idea that came up in the sessions as part of the agenda that I think is intellectually intriguing, it would be quite tricky to, to achieve, would be could we get to your point on a simplified terms and conditions? We might not be able to get it that simplified, mm -hmm. but could there be a global internet, bill, internet user's bill of rights in terms of what you, should you expect? Do you have the right to monetize it? A full acknowledgement that governments will need access to some types of, of data, but what kind of transparency you can have into those types of requests, et cetera. You can imagine a very simple eight to you know, 12 point bill of rights that could lay out the basics for people it, and really set, establish some good ground rules. Is it your view that um, access to data has gone too far at this point and that we need to roll that back somewhat? No, I don't. I think that when you look at some of the really amazing things that can happen, I think that part of it is you need to start to look at all the signals and figure out what you can ultimately determine. I know one of the, one of the most amazing things I saw in the past few days is that Philips has a smartphone application that can take your heart rate through a video image of your face. Yes, yes. You just hold it in front of you and it literally just looks at the micro flushes in your face and it can tell you your heart rate. But what if and, you know, and I think it, until you start really giving people the technology mm -hmm. and the data to experiment, you can't get really interesting innovations like that. But what if Philips then sells that information to an insurance company that decides on that basis that it chooses not to insure me or it actually um, increases the amount that I need to pay for that insurance as a result? Well, again, this comes back to the terms and conditions and possibly to that, to that Bill of Rights should it be developed. So you understand as a user, wait, is this just for my use, which right now it is just for your use, yeah. right? Or is it something that you could elect to send to an insurance company or is it something that would be compulsorily sent? But I, I personally think it should be your election. Uh, Mr. Jack, I wonder if I can bring this question to you and, and really just get your perspective on whether you think access to data at this point in the marketplace in which you operate mostly is appropriate, <laughs> government access to data is appropriate, and whether you think that the Chinese situation compares favorably or otherwise with uh, the situation that you find in the US or elsewhere. I think real data is part of their own personal property. It's like your deposit at a bank. Without approval from the person that owns it, it must not be used. Well, in the financial sector, we have very strict confidentiality measures. Uh, your deposit clearly is confidential. You will not want that to be known. So that's a protection of uh, personal data. In China, information protection is not, it's quite good, but we see that uh, there are breaches of the confidentiality uh, in China. We also noticed that there are cases in which there were attacks on the network in order to obtain personal data. That's not what we would like to see. Going forward, we've heard from many speakers here already, there will be cloud computing, there will be uh, further internet development, but there's a prerequisite that's crucial that is to protect the safety of your data. If we can't do that, no one will want to save any data they consider important on the cloud. Thank you very much. So I'd like to move now away from technology, but keep your headset on, because I'll start with Mr. Jiang. Um, one of the other big messages that came out here, I think, is when do CEOs become comfortable enough with the recovery to start going out and spending some of that money that currently sits on balance sheets. And I'd just like to ask the, the leaders of businesses on the panel, for 2014, will you be investing um, significant amounts in the business or spending some, some of the money that currently sits on 
balance sheets. And Mr. Jiang, let me start with you. <laughs> we have been rather stingy, not spending a lot of money, even when the economy was very good. We will be like that. I think investment depends on return. If there are good opportunities, we'll seize them. Also, we need to look for assets that are currently undervalued. That's also a good, good opportunity. After several years of downturn in global economy, we do see assets that are quite attractive because they are not highly priced. So I think it's an excellent opportunity. Let's seize the opportunity. When recovery is really underway, such opportunities might disappear. Joseph. Well, uh, Novartis is in a quiet period until next Wednesday when we announce our earnings. So I can't talk specifically what, uh, about 14, but I'll talk in fine. general, in, yeah. in generalities. We are investing, obviously, in the business, but we are or I am not leaning forward in terms of aggressive new investment in all areas like we would have if we were to see stronger economic growth. So what I'm waiting for and looking for is uh, to look for that uptick in, in what this forum was all about, which is how can we start to drive more economic growth than we're seeing today. Okay, Christoph. <clears throat> well, uh, we, are, we are in a strange situation. First, I mean, I mean, a company like uh, Total doesn't invest on a year-per-year -year basis. So we invest for the 20 years to come. And uh, what is expecting from us, our investors are expecting that we count down a little bit our investment. So the funny thing, if I can say, is yes, we will be reducing a little bit the size of our investment. Not because we consider that 2014 is a risk, but just because we have to a little bit slow down. Last year, because I can still talk about 2013, but not yet of 2014, I don't know, uh, the capital expenditures of the group, organic investment, $28 billion. So we'll have to reduce this by a few billion dollars, which still means we have a long-term view on energy, fossils or renewables, like solar, which means that we will have to continue to invest largely and for the long term. Okay. Um, Judith, do you want to participate on this one? I, I will just say um, that if we talk about inclusive economies <coughs> and there really is a focus on both unemployment and inequality, then we need business to step up more and take a fewer, more bullish. We can't expect business to sit back and wait for economic growth. You are the engines of economic growth. And so let's make sure that smart investments fueling the economy is part of how you define your success for 2014. Chris. So we believe 2014 will be better than 2013. Uh, we get that feedback from our clients because that's what is going to drive ours is a B2B business. So that's what is going to drive our outlook and we are optimistic. Marissa. Well, for Yahoo, we are um, embarking on a renaissance and we're really trying to find new growth. And in our business, new growth comes from innovation. It comes from entrepreneurship. So for us, 2013 was a year of investment. Uh, we made more than two dozen acquisitions. They were all small acquisitions, and in, many, in most cases, with the exception of Tumblr. Uh, and the, what that's really provided for us is you know, two dozen or more entrepreneurs who are bringing new ideas, fresh technology to the problems that we work on each day.